Welcome back to our series of e-lectures about the history of English. This e-lecture discusses the sound inventory of Middle English, indicating the type of sound changes that led from Old English to Middle English and illustrating the pronunciation of Middle English using as many examples as possible. We will do the following in this e-lecture. First, we will define a reference variety of Middle English then we will point out the major changes that happened from Old English to Middle English. We will list and discuss the Middle English phonemes and will eventually exemplify Middle English on the basis of an excerpt from the Canterbury Tales. Now, during the Middle English period that lasted from 1100 to 1500, dialectal differences were becoming greater than during the Anglo-Saxon times where West Saxon had emerged as some sort of standard. The dialectal situation in Middle English was different and a new standard was eventually based on London speech, essentially an East Midland dialect. The transition from Old English to Middle English was marked by a number of sound changes that affected both consonants and vowels. Whereas most consonantal changes had little or no effect on the general organization of the English language, the vocalic changes by contrast were highly influential with regard to the development of Middle English morphology. In particular, the realization and eventual loss of vowels in unstressed syllables as in Old English Herte, where we marked the stressed syllable in red, led to the weakening of the entire Old English case system in Middle English and thus eventually to the fixing of word order from a relatively free word order in Old English to SVO in Middle English. Well, here is the second step that led to this reduction, the loss of the final unstressed vowel which led to the pronunciation of herte to hert and from here it's only a small step to present-day English heart. Let us look at the phonemic changes in detail. Do you remember the old English fricative rule? Well, here it is. It was quite simple. It simply said that the fricatives, the dental fricative th, the labiodental fricative f, and the alveolar fricative s, here expressed by a placeholder, a capital, you might call it archiphoneme, had two allophones each. A voiced one in voiced environments, for example, drivan, and a voiceless one elsewhere. Here the example is für. This changed in Middle English. Now all former fricative allophones became new phonemes. For example, the labiodental one v, the dental one the, and the alveolar one z. This phenomenon has become known as the voicing of fricatives. It is not entirely clear why English that had got along nicely without a voiced, voiceless, phonemic fricative contrast for almost half a millennium should develop such a feature. The following hypotheses are generally put forward. The influence of French loanwords could have been at work. A mixture of several dialects could have influenced this development. And last but not least, the loss of final vowels which led to a less voiced environment. Over and above these changes in the inventory of consonantal phonemes, the following consonantal changes occurred during the Middle English period. Well, here is the first one. The loss of glottal fricatives before consonants. Examples are items such as hlaf, which became laugh, hrather, which became rather. 
Now we know that there are some environments where this did not take place. For example, the typical environment is the WH environment where the glottal fricative has survived even until the present day in some varieties of English. Some people still say which or where and so on. Another example is the loss of the voiced velar fricative, a typical Germanic consonant. Halrian became Halwen, Furl became Fowl. Or take this one, the, the loss of the labiovelar approximant after consonants. The examples listed here are Two, which became To, or Swa, which became Sa. Further consonantal changes are here, for example, the loss of the voiceless affricate, alveo post-alveolar affricate in unstressed syllables. So here the syllables have been nicely marked by the dot separator. Soth, li, che became sothlier. Another typical change that affected the transition from Old English to Middle English is the loss or the replacement of the prefix y by a simple vowel. So items such as jenoch became inoch, jedriven became idriven. So clearly a change of the prefix. And finally, due to the leveling of unstressed syllables, final nasals were lost, lost typically in infinitives such as luvian, which became luvia, or driven which became driver. Let's now look at some vocalic changes. Now the most significant vocalic change in Middle English was the addition of new diphthongs due to the influence of French of course or due to some consonantal changes. Well here are some of them. Oi was a new one as in joya. O came in new as, as in growen and I as in cider. Further inventorial changes concerned the loss of the rounded front vowel U where für became fear and the raising of the low back vowel A to O example stan became storn. The most influential change, as already said, was the weakening of vowels in unstressed syllables, all of them appearing as the central vowel schwa. And the examples we've listed here are stanas, which became stanus, furol, which became foul. In spelling, by the way, unstressed vowels were mostly represented by the character e. Other phonological changes that mark the transition from Old English to Middle English include the disappearance of the low front vowel a, the so-called ash, which became more centralized, and the monophthongization of most Old English diphthongs. Let's now look at the phonemes of Middle English in detail. There were, first of all, 13 monophthongs seven long ones like in Old English, five short monophthongs and one central monophthong. The number of diphthongs was now six and there were 23 consonantal phonemes in Middle English. Let us look at them in detail. Here are the seven long monophthongs. Now, apart from some qualitative changes, that is, vowel length, the quantity, that is, the position, front, back, high, low, was retained as a distinctive feature in most cases. Furthermore, the Old English diphthongs became monophthongs in Middle English. The most significant change, as you can see here, was that Middle English no longer had rounded front vowels such as U or U. Here are the long monophthongs. The high front vowel E as in tide, present day English tide. The mid high front vowel E as in green, present day English green. 
The middle front vowel a eh, as in mat present day English meat. The low central vowel a eh, as in marken present day English make. The mid low back vowel o eh, as in goat present day English goat. The mid high back vowel o eh, as in ford present day English food and finally the high back vowel u as in hus present day English house orthographically by the way length was no longer indicated by a macron but either by vowel length or vowel clusters or it had to be remembered let's now add the five short vowels and the central monophthong to this system. Now let's listen. There was a short E as in kissen. There was a short E as in bed. There was a short A slightly backed as in that. There was a short O as in hoppen. There was a short U as in full. And last but not least, there was a central vowel as in mother, present day English mother. Okay, so much for the monophthongs. Let's now turn our attention to the six diphthongs in Middle English. Although all Old English diphthongs smoothed to monophthongs in Middle English, an assortment of new diphthongs arose, most of them as a result of the vocalization of Old English consonants, primarily the approximant w or the rounded front vowel u, and they occurred between vowels but were now turned into diphthongs. The diphthongs were all closing, that is their second vocalic element was higher than its onset. This movement towards a higher target can also be referred to as upgliding. Here they are. Let's start with the back upgliding diphthongs. There's first of all this one here. Eu as in triuwe. Then we have eu as in feuwe. Present day English few. And there was this one O as in blow, present day English blow. And now the front up gliding ones, here they are. A as in day, present day English day. Oi as in present day English joy, middle English joy. And finally, ui as in point, present day English point. So much for the vowels, monophthongs and diphthongs. Now here are the consonants and as we said there were 23 consonantal phonemes. Middle English retained all Old English consonants. The only system-wide change between the consonants of Old English and Middle English was the already mentioned addition of the phonemic voiced fricatives. For example, s as in son or z as in reason were no longer allophones of the same phoneme but became independent phonemes. And inventorially, the sound inventory was now almost identical with that of present day English. Only on the allophonic level we still had the palatal and velar fricatives as allophones of a glottal fricative. Here they are. Sch as in Licht and Ch as in Thucht. As far as roticity was concerned, Middle English still had a high degree of roticity, that is, the 
R was pronounced in all contexts, even after vowels. And like in Old English, it is still hard to say what type of R was used. The alveolar trill, the alveolar approximant, or in special cases the alveolar flap, as in driven. Thus, it seems reasonable to assume that the allophones of R vary freely. So, you have the choice. You can either say ridden or ridden. You can say year or year. Finally, some comments about the orthography of Middle English. Now, the Norman Conquest made the change from Old English to Middle English look more sudden than it really was by introducing new spelling conventions. The Normans disregarded traditional Anglo-Saxon spelling and simply spelt the language as they heard it, using many of the conventions of Norman French. During the Middle English period, spelling styles varied greatly over time and in different areas of the country. The alphabet shown here thus contains only generalizations, focusing primarily on the most common features of Middle English. And as you can see, there was no longer any use of the macron to indicate vowel length. So this was out. Vowels such as the ash and the ev were no longer used and the thorn also gradually disappeared. All these vowels were no longer, vowels and consonants were no longer used. The thorn, however, was still at least at the beginning part of the system and then quite interestingly there's a new consonant that supplemented the Middle English alphabet. By and large, however, the alphabet became almost identical with what we know from present-day English. Before we now exemplify Middle English, let's say something about the literature that serves as the basis for this exemplification. The many linguistic developments which identify the Middle English period are most evident in the poetry and prose of the second half of the 14th century. There are several surviving prose texts, especially on religious themes, notably the first complete translation of the Bible into English by John Wycliffe, and among the best-known poetic creations of that time is the poem Piers Plowman by William Langland. However, the universally best-known poetic achievement in Middle English are, of course, the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. They provide a wealth of information about the medieval attitudes and society and about the contemporary linguistic structure and style. And now I'm going to exemplify Middle English by reading a passage from the Canterbury Tales. In fact, I will take the prologue of the Canterbury Tales. Here it is. One that April, with his showrous sorter, the drucht of March, hath parsed to the rota, and bathed every vein in switch liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the flour. Juan Zephyrus eke, with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every halt and haste, the tender croppus and the younger sonne, hath in the ram his halve course irone, and smale foulus marken melodie, that slepen all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh him naturen here courageous, than a folk to gone on pilgrimages, 
and palmres for to seeken strongest rondus, to ferne halves, couth in sundry londus. Well, that may suffice as an impression, and we can now summarize this e lecture. The Middle English sound system was in a transition from a system very much Germanic in character to a sound system that was now influenced by French and had changed in several ways. New vowels and consonants came in and suprasegmental aspects affected the metrical structure of words. The effects of these changes on Middle English morphology and syntax were not discussed in this e-lecture. However, from the general principles of language change we know that phonological changes are always at work when more dramatic linguistic changes affect the morphology and the syntax of a language. And exactly this is what happened. From a synthetic language with a relatively free word order, Middle English changed to a far more analytic language with a more or less fixed word order. We will come back with this in another e-lecture about the morphology and syntax and all these changes that Middle English underwent. So see you there.